Good morning and welcome to Wadi Christian Church. Well, let us go to God in prayer. I'll give us some time to pray silently and then I'll close us in a community prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we invite your spirit into this place, into our hearts, into our worship, into our lives. We ask that you be with us and guide us as we gather this day, that the songs we sing and the words we say may be pleasing to you. May you go with us as we leave this place, helping us to share your good news to everyone we meet. In your holy name, O oh God, we pray. It's three weeks. We'll see how that goes from here. All right, so our scripture today comes from the book of Matthew. Uh, it's Matthew chapter 9, starting at verse 35. Just to kind of give you a little bit of context for where we are, because we are kind of jumping around a little bit right now. Um, Jesus is in the point of his ministry where he's been showing his disciples all the things that he can do. So he's already shown them that he can heal, that he can teach, that he can go, and he can preach. Uh, and so now he's getting them ready to do the same thing, to follow in his footsteps. This is the, the story as he's getting ready to send them out to do the things that he's already been doing. So this is where this comes in. Um, and it's Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. And it goes like this. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And then he begins to prepare them by sending them out into different places. And we're just going to read just two verses in the next chapter, that verse 7 and 8 where he tells them what they're going to do, like as they go out. He says to them, as you go, preach the message that the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, and freely give what you have received. Okay, so that's the tall order that he's giving to his disciples, and perhaps we can overhear <coughs> There is a popular expression in culture which expresses an exasperation in the face of trying to govern over the people's behavior, particularly those with individual preferences, goals, agendas, and initiatives. Those who have no interest in being governed at all. Throwing their hands up in frustration, leaders trying to command such individuals into a group with a common goal may exclaim, oh, it's like herding cats. In case you're wondering, Camp is a lot like that. You've got 20 people all going in different directions. You're trying to get them all in the same direction, doing the same thing. You're trying to keep a schedule. There are no clocks, and the cell phones don't work, and they're spread out across the fields. And this kid wants to do this thing, and this kid wants to do this thing, and this adult's over here doing that. And this. But at some point, we have to unite on a common goal. Where are they at? So what does that phrase mean? Herding cats. It reflects that independent nature of cats. When you think of it in comparison to dogs, I mean, dogs, they want to be loyal, they want to be where you are, they're going to pretty much do what you tell them to do. I mean, there are some exceptions. We've all known that one dog of ours that doesn't want to go and they're supposed to go. But for the most part, they're amicable and obedient. But if you're a cat owner, you've been around cats, you know that all changes. You know that cats cannot be coerced. It goes inherently against their nature. The more you try to coerce a cat, the more they will resist and demand to go its own way. You can try to entice it or lure it or connect with it on an emotional level, but you will likely only succeed if you, in trying to command it and it will not happen. Now, try to get 10 cats of those sweet, furry faces, independently minded creatures for the common interest, it is not gonna happen. But, but, 
What happens if you put out 10 food bowls that don't say a word? What happens? They all show up, right? Their supersonic hearing will already have been switched to the desire button. Uh, and even though they have a mind of their own, they're all gonna come and find a bowl or push someone out of their space to get exactly what they want. They will appear almost immediately, all at once, all sweet and eager and ready to eat. Now, we know cats are not the only creatures with minds of their own. Parents, oh, have you seen a thing or two about that when you're raising your children? You show them, you know, those kinds of issues. Think about a toddler, for instance. You need the toddler to eat the broccoli. Or a teenager, clean their room. If the desire and motivation isn't there, there is not an amount of coercion that will turn their heads to the benefit of either eating the broccoli or cleaning the room. It's not gonna happen. So how do you deal with the kids with these parental issues? You entice them, you invite them, you present them, you explain to them, you show them the benefits of doing the activity, you build the relationship, you explain, you do all those kinds of things. You give it a shot. And then, sometimes, you just let it go. You just say, okay, it's not going to happen. We had a kid at camp this week, refused to eat any of the food that we prepared for him. There was no salad bar he was gonna have, there was no hot meal he was gonna have. He had peanut butter and jelly or a bowl of cereal. That's it, the entire week of camp. We tried everything, asking him what he likes to eat, trying to order food to come in. We did everything we could think of. And finally, we had to get to the point where he's being fed. You have to choose your balance, right? He's being fed, he's doing what he wants to do, he's still in the group. We gotta let this go. Let him do what he is going to do. Now, these instances and are concerning one person with one goal. Imagine trying to get eight or 20 of these children with their own ideas, their own preferences, their own minds to engage in one common goal. Isn't that goal of every teacher every year? Try to get 35 in a classroom to all be focused on the same thing and doing the same project? And every parent, when they have more than one child at a time, it's also the challenge of any business or group or, yes, even churches. When dealing with very different people with different personalities, different interests, different ideas, different proposed goals, how do you get a group to go in the way of the company or the family or the church's mission? <laughs> I can tell you for a fact, it's like herding cats. <laughs> so what do we know then? If we know that's what it is, then we also know it's not about coercion. It's not about control. It's not about winning approval. It's not about forcing an outcome. When people are running in different directions, with different motivations, different intentions. It does no good to try to command them to do something else. You can't command them into a common direction, right? It's futile to try to control this outcome. When you try to attempt this difficult and impossible task of herding cats, you'll become easily frustrated and spend more time trying to herd, lead, we could say it, people than in leading the project or mission itself. So, how do you engage people together in a mission? How do you encourage them in the common direction? Well, Jesus explains that very thing in the scripture for today. I know. He helps the apostles understand how to guide or herd, herd people with little or no knowledge of Christ and his new way to be baptized in his name and form communities of faith in which they would serve and honor each other, where they could live in one common goal, to operate out of a brand new ethic and identity. Think about this for a moment. That's a pretty tall order that he's giving to them, to these nobodies. Jesus is about to send out his 12 apostles to do just this, and here is what he tells them. He infused them first for the power to do the job. Then he gave them the following advice. As you go, proclaim the good news. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out the demons. 
give without payment, take nothing with you but the mercy of you to seek and build relationship with. In every town or village, stay with someone. If that person welcomes you, your message, then bless it. If they don't, shake off the dust of your feet and leave and move on. That's what he tells them. Then he goes on to say, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, this is a dangerous mission. Many people are going to hate you, but don't worry. You'll be amply rewarded in the end for delivering this important message. I don't know how comforting that is all the time, right? People are going to hate you, but don't worry. Speak of things in the end. What Jesus is telling them, though, is that they cannot herd cats by trying to control them. You can't order them. You can't command them. You can't control the outcome of their mission. They must instead what? Feed them. Right? How do you herd a cat? You feed it. How do you herd a group of people? You feed them. You must build relationships, build trust, take nothing but give people the food that they need, which is healing, raising from the dead, curing, proclaiming. What did Jesus tell Peter? He's going to be the, the rock of the church, right? What does he tell him to do? They eat my sheep. He does not tell him to create bylaws. He does not tell him to create a worship service. He does not tell him to get committees together. He says, feed my sheep. Herald, help, and heal. Not herd, hate, and handle. I love that. I thought that was cute. I thought that was that. That's the secret of true shepherding in Jesus' spirit. No one. No one. Let me say this again and again and again and again. No one, especially no one with their own mind, ideas, thoughts, and goals, wants to be hurried or controlled or handled. Does that surprise you? Then why do we as a church continue trying to do it? We know it does not what people want, because we don't want it. So why do we want to do it to other people? But if you want to truly present someone with a better way, if you want to herald them and help them and heal them, then you have to tell them the good news, right? That news that can change their lives and make their lives better and more peaceful and more beautiful. You have to help them in their daily lives build a relationship of trust and true care. The good shepherd does not pretend to love his sheep. The good shepherd loves his sheep. And everything more derives from the loving relationship, that loving intent. That's how you heal them. That's how you change their lives in real and tangible ways. When Jesus traveled during his life and ministry throughout all the regions of the Jewish and Gentile world at a time in search for lost sheep, he never once commanded you do something specific, right? He does not tell them you have to go and do this, 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 and this. What's his only command? Love one another. That's it. Oh, how we get off of that beaten path so much. He never really attempted to coerce people to thinking the way that he did. What did he do? Primarily, he healed. He offered them healing. <coughs> Everywhere he went, he healed, he raised, he pointed to the majesty of God. His message really and truly spoke for itself and spoke for the power and presence of God. He had no need of doing anything more. He had provided the food <coughs> and the people came to see. They believed and they converted and they praised God and they changed hearts. This is a message now that he needs to get across to his disciples. You can try to herd cats all you want, he says, but you'll never build a kingdom that way. Instead, proclaim my message. Heal, raise the dead, cast out the demons. Some will listen and some will not. <coughs> Don't try to control the outcomes. Just do the things that I tell you to do and walk away. God will take care of the rest. Jesus' message then, his evangelistic method, if you want to call it that, works the same today as it did all those years ago. We live in a divisive culture. As always, through the ages, people will think independently, will have their own ideas, their own religions, their own beliefs, their own goals, their own agendas. And you will never, ever succeed trying to convince them of your way, of the church's way, of Jesus' way or a common way. 
Because Jesus' message is not about convincing, but about convicting. And that happens through demonstration. It's through how you live your life, through how you love and show that compassion. Through the gifts of healing and wholeness, through life-changing assistance, through relationships built on trust, through non-judgmental empathy. Oh! Through understanding. Jesus' message, God's message for humankind has never been about control, but about redemption. Never about force, but about free will. In Jesus' sacrifice, he offered us a better way, a way of peace and love and salvation and a kingdom collaborative spirit. He showed us what it looked like through his actions and his humility and his healings and his sacrificial love. This is the way to shepherd God's people. This is the way to be Jesus' disciple and his apostles. So, you know, I was at camp this week and most of you have never been to this campground, so I can only kind of give you a, a broad understanding. But just know this, most all of the buildings on the property were built in the 50s. And the plan was, you know how we love our plans, was to do something temporary, and then as we got money and built up, then we would do, build better things. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem was, you know, the 60s came and the church went, and now we have this property, and so now we're just going to pour in money to fix the things that we have instead of building new, because that's the money that we have. So, I mean, there were some great things to come out of the 50s, but consider outdoor buildings and the problems that you're going to have with those if they were built in the 50s, and all that you've done since then is patch them. So we had flooding in the kitchen, and we have, you know, bathhouses that are on their last legs. We're building a new bathhouse, but it's taking forever. We're on year three, and we just have walls. So it's, it's been a long, long process. Um, and so uh, the bathhouses that we have are old cement buildings with, you know, uh, shower curtains barely hanging on. You can see lots of cracks in the foundations and everywhere, there's lots of bugs. It's a wonderful facility, in case you can't understand this. And it is not uncommon for things to break in the facilities. Um, as you well know, those of you who are homeowners probably know better than others. Um, but anyway, so there was this one particular night when the boys all at the same time come running out of the bathhouse and run straight to the guy counselors screaming, the urinal fell all by itself. We were all on the other side. We were all, we were over there doing that, and the urinal just fell. Now, <laughs> I'm not saying that they weren't being 100 percent truthful because, in fact, it could have very well just fallen off the wall because it's an old facility. But I'm not entirely certain that they were being 100 percent honest. All the same, they all came up with the story that they were all the showers I heard a loud crash, they all ran over it, and the urinal was on the ground. Magically, it had come apart from the pipe, so water was not going everywhere. Just the actual top part had come across and it was laying on. It looked a lot like shoe prints and someone was standing on it, but again, that was their story was that they were all on the other side, they stayed connected in their story, their alibi was tight, they were all on the other side and it just fell. <clears throat> so, you know, what you have to do as, as adults in a facility that you're still trying to patch through until this new place is built, so we have to make the phone call to the plumber, okay, here's what's happened, we, you know, we're gonna buy a new one, can you come put it in, you know, those kinds of things, you have to have those conversations. And, um, you know, and it, it was not a huge deal, because again, we're used to it with these older facilities, things happen <coughs> magically and otherwise. But it did kind of make me think about the things that you have to do to fix up those older facilities. And it made me, you know, teachable moment, you know, the preacher in me, the teachable moment in me, made me think about those things in our own lives that fall apart even when we're not a part of them, and even when we don't choose them, even when we're doing the right thing. Sometimes things just happen. 
and we don't have to call a very expensive plumber to come and fix those things for us. We can simply lift them up to God, and we have that ability as a people of faith. Parents today in our culture, we celebrate Father's Day. My prayer is that all of our fathers can demonstrate the peace and understanding of human nature as our Heavenly Father um, has done for us today and going forward. That you may build relationships with your children, that you may teach them the way of Jesus by living that way in your life, that you may share with them your faults and your mistakes and tell them how God has gifted you with grace, love, understanding, and the ability to forge a new way. That you will listen to them, that you will heal them, that you will pick them up when they fall, and that you will guide them. But most of all, that you will feed them with all the love that you can give. So may God bless you in your mission, in your families, in your lives, and in your communities, and in your life. And may we as a congregation continue to feed those around us. Amen. Now, I do have to give the boys a hard time about the breaking of the urinal, but there was only five boys of a camp. So they kind of had the, the sweet spot of camp because it was mostly girls and these five boys. But I was really proud of these kids because um, we have a pool this year. It's first year we're having a pool, doing all these improvements. But there was this one day where they had free time and they were going to go. They all went and got on their swim seats and those kinds of things. But one boy didn't want to go swimming. I don't know if he was just uncomfortable with taking his shirt off, like what it may have been. But he was really not feeling it. He was trying to figure out a way out of it. And he was going to come join a different group, you know, kind of thing. But the other boy, seeing how uncomfortable he was, decided to not go swimming. So they invited him instead to go play volleyball, which I thought was the sweetest thing. Because you could clearly tell they were excited about swimming. They already had their stuff up. But when they saw that, they changed their plans. And I thought about that that is what the church is. That is what the church should be. That we should be looking out for the least of these and how can we make them feel included. Maybe it's not what we've planned and what we want. It's not the music we like or the games that we want to do, but that it's about what they need to feel closer to the community and to us. And so as we join in our discipleship hymn today, I want us to think about the ways in which we can include and feed and herd the cats around us and each other. So let us join in singing our discipleship hymn as we think about that commitment. And also I have to say, you know, because I haven't said it yet today, this side wins. Uh, 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 <laughs> you know now. Yeah. I mean, it's very clear. You gotta walk down this aisle, and <laughs> Yes, but you're in between us. Next time, no. May you go from this place remembering that they'll know you're a Christian, not by your words that you say or the the you know the shirts that you wear, but by the love that you show. And may you show the love to everyone that you meet. Amen. Thank you.